Hey everybody, welcome back to the Single Dad, Single Mom podcast. I am your host, Joseph Rochelle. With me as always, of course, is Nicole Cox. Nicole is remote today. Hi guys. Yeah. Yes. You are doing a little work remote, yeah. Yeah. I don't know where you are, but it looks beautiful. Thank you. It, it blurry, it's blurry but beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> So today we are uh, going to talk about, we actually found um, uh, the, the other day at my church, I came across uh, a gentleman who is involved in a very unique charity that I was really excited to tell Nicole about. And of course, when I did, Nicole was equally excited. And uh, we decided to bring them on and talk about what they're doing for single parents. Uh, but caveat is they're not doing it in America. So we're going to get to that in just a little bit. But before we do, I want to, of course, thank our sponsors, One Audio, for our awesome headphones. Uh, as yeah. You, as you'll be able to see, our guests are wearing them. I'm wearing them. They are fantastic. I'm missing mine today. <laughs> I know. They're here in the studio with me. Um, but that's okay. Uh, so I'll put the link in there. If you want to get some great headphones that are uh, not only great quality, but also great price, definitely check out One Audio. The link will be in the comment section below of this video. Okay. So, Nicole. Are you ready? I am ready. We're going we're to go ahead and kick this off with our guest today. So before, uh, without further ado, let me introduce you to John and Dan of the Cairo Foundation. Is that right, guys? Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for coming in and being on. So the other day uh, we had lunch together and I got to learn all about what it is that you're doing. And I'm not going to go ahead and butcher it myself. I'm going to let you kind of explain exactly what it is that you do, because you can do it so much better than I do. But uh, so I guess without further ado, who wants to take, take the lead, take the ball? Go ahead. Okay. I guess I'll kick it off. Um, I just want to sort of take a moment here to make sure I introduce John properly, because John is the founder of the foundation. He operates it. He is a resident of Rwanda, Africa. Okay. And uh, that's where the foundation is located. And uh, I am relatively new to the organization because um, it's been privately funded up till now. And so um, he's built it up to the point where now we have to start um, uh, raising funds from other sources in order to continue with the work because uh, I would say that, uh, and John, please correct me if I'm wrong here, but the demand that it just is, is coming to him organically without ever any advertising or anything is about three times what he's capable of taking on in terms of the need we're trying oh, wow. to fill over there. And so you can imagine that once we get the word out, um, the, the, you know, the demand that will rise that much more. And so um, I think a good place for us to start is uh, because John is the founder and it was created out of his heart uh, for the, the situation over there. And so, uh, John, would you please take a few minutes to kind of go through um, a little bit about your history and, and what brought you to the point where you felt called to yeah. open this ministry? Thank you, Dan. <clears throat> My name is uh, John Africa, and uh, I come from Rwanda. Uh, but yeah. uh, I was born in Uganda in a, a refugee camp um, where my parents had been also living as refugees. Uh, from Rwanda. They, they got kicked out of Rwanda in 1959 during the first genocide. So uh, they went to Uganda. Uganda is a native, uh, our neighboring country in the north. So they lived there and that's where I was born. Uh, I was born at the time when um, the culture really was very difficult when it came to, you know, uh, women. Women were not really allowed uh, equal opportunity with uh, their counterparts, male. So when I, when I was born, we were in a refugee camp and um, um, UNICEF was helping out to, uh, to yeah. take kids to school because our okay. parents could not afford, you know, to take us to school. So I went to school uh, via the help of uh, UNICEF. And then um, when I was going to school, I would go to a boarding school and then I would come back home. When I came back home from school, I found out that uh, my 15-year-old sister had been married off. So I asked my, my mother, where's my sister? She said, she's married. I didn't even know what married, what it meant because I was very young, really. So I asked her, what's that? And then she said, she's going to create a family. I asked her, why is she not going to school like me? She said to me, son, education is not for the girls. Education is for you, a young man. Girls are supposed to, you know, oh. go out, you know, make family, have children. That's how 
that how, that's how it was with me, and that's how it's going to be with your sisters. So I felt really, you know, uh, very, you know, I, I felt pain inside because I had lost my sister. I wasn't able to, to pray with her again. And, you know, like children pray with their, you know, their, their sisters and brothers. And um, um, I, it just got me thinking what it was. I mean, why would they not be given an opportunity to go to school just like us? So that really, like, you know, uh, it kept me, it kept, I kept it in my heart and I went to school. By God's grace, I went to college, graduated, and then um, I was determined to change the narrative of our communities and, and our society. So I started a little bit, you know, advocating for girls to go to school throughout my community back in Uganda, in the refugees where we, we used to live. Mm. Um, then let alone I got an opportunity to go to Kenya for my master's degree. And I went and, uh, you know, did my uh, uh, graduate uh, degree in uh, education. I was really determined to, to make a difference for my community. I wanted to really go back and, you know, educate them that they needed to give girls an opportunity to go to school. And uh, wow. that, uh, that really, like, you know, was, uh, I, wa it was, I was motivated by the fact that all these sisters of mine got married. They, they never had an opportunity to go to school just like me. And it wasn't mm -hmm. happening in my family. It was happening to throughout the entire community. And I, I, felt, that I felt called to really, like, you know, uh, you know, pray apart to change the narrative, to change this kind of culture. Were you met with a lot of resistance from the community? Definitely, definitely. They, they would say, oh, the, the son of so-and-so is trying to really, like, you know, you know, uh, you know uh, make our girls, uh, you know, go to school. Uh, we, uh, you know, we, we are supposed to really, like, you know, uh, get them married off and we get, uh, you know, dowry. Dowry is like, you know, the bride price, you know? That's true. And uh, there was a lot of assistance, of course, but then uh, uh, little by little, uh, with few steps, uh, some other guys like me also joined me and it, it kind of like, you know, started taking loot. And, um, uh, you know, uh, I want you to understand that uh, families there, they believe in a polygamous family. One man can get married to, uh, you know, several wives, you know, he can have several wives. And uh, my dad was a polygamous man. He had three wives and we were over, you know, 18 kids. And, you know, uh, my young siblings from my, my, my other stepmothers, they all went to school because of, uh, you know, the advocacy that I was able to put forward. And oh, wow. yeah, and uh, of course, I was now growing up, I was a young man and I, I, I stood up to my dad. I said, no, you can't, you know, you can't, you know, get them, you know, you can't send them to, for forced marriages. They, are, they have to go to school. So I actually mm -hmm. started by, you know, paying tuition for my sisters, my young siblings. Mm -hmm. And that kind of like encouraged my dad to, you know, to really like, you know, join me to send the kids to school. And then other, other family members, my uncles and all that, they also wanted to follow suit. And um, when I went to Nairobi for my graduate, uh, even actually my, my dissertation was about, you know, the community change, community transformation. So right. uh, I came back, uh, worked in Uganda for about, I think, six months. But then I felt cold that I needed to go back to, to Rwanda to trace my roots. And, and you know, Rwanda had just emerged from um, one of the horrific genocide of 21st century, where, you know, a million people had just been butchered within three months. And at the watch of the, the world, you know, nations, and they never did anything. So um, most of us young men were, were, were getting out of the camp, going to Rwanda to help rebuild the country. So when I got to when I got to Rwanda, uh, I found out that the country was transitioning from French system into English uh, system. So mm -hmm. re remember, I am a teacher educated from the British background because Uganda wow. is a former British colony, and we okay. the system of education is British. So I could speak English. So I knew what to do with the with the, with the, the Minister of Education. I tried to help them set up the systems and then relay the curriculum from uh, French into English. It wasn't me alone. I, we were doing it, you know, several of us who, who had come from Uganda. But I really took the lead to, to uh, relay the curriculum of the, of the country and be able to support them to transition from uh, French into English. And Rwanda uh, wanted to break ties with French because uh, they blamed French for having supported the previous regime that killed some people. 
So they were trying to join the communist countries. These are countries that were formerly colonized by Britain. So I helped wow. in the transition of education, started off as a school principal. My school was a private school. We taught in English, but we're also leading other schools to help other teachers teach in English and, and to coach them how to you know, manage and you know, lead their schools properly. I did that and then um, let alone I, for, I did that for 10 years. But throughout mm -hmm. my um, 10 years as school principal, I you know, kept doing the same thing advocating for you know, families to send their girl, uh, their, their girl kids to school. Uh, because the mm -hmm. culture in Rwanda and Uganda is, is pretty the same. That, that entire region of, uh, of East Africa, it's the same. So I did that for 10 years. Then at alone I was, uh, uh, I, I uh, <coughs> finished off being a school principal, went to work for the Ministry of Education <coughs> into curriculum development and also uh, coaching school principals and teachers on how to really like you know teach in English and to be able to do a, a good job, so I did that also for six years. But also uh, as I was you know working with the Minister of Education, my part of my role was to go through schools, see how many how many uh, how many kids are you know have not dropped out of school because kids who drop out of school for for several reasons. One of the reasons is that uh, parents cannot really you know provide for their kids. Uh, meals, three, three, you know, meal, uh, you know, most families can't really provide meals for their kids to go to school. So kids would go uh, drop out of school to go and, to go for, work for money to be able to, you know, support themselves. And then we would encourage parents to uh, not really like, you know, uh, send their kids to markets and mining presses uh, to work for money. Uh, the government was like, prime uh, elementary school is free. So every kid should go to school, but that's great. Yeah, but uh, it was this was the opposite. You know, the, the community would want the kids to go to work for money, and then the girls would also be you know sent off for you know for marriages, and men would take advantage of them, and it was really terrible. It was a catastrophe. About thirty thousand uh, you know young women uh, in in in, a, in, a, in an entire district. They are, really? they, are, they have dropped out of school because they are pregnant, because they have been, you know, forced into marriages, you know, okay. all that. And then when COVID hit, it was, it, it, it made it more worse. Thousands of girls were really like, you know, out of school with, you know, babies, no, 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 no husbands. You ask them, who, is, who, who, who gave you this baby? Who made you pregnant? So I don't know, you know? So uh, it was really very bad, and uh, so we we had uh, uh, a, disciple, a, a Bible study that was happening at my house every Wednesday, and then some mm -hmm. of the some of the kids in our community, these young women, you know, 14, 15, 17 years, they would come to our Bible study, and then I and my wife were like, we can't just Bible study can't just help them, we need to do something, so we started supporting 30 girls by sending them to a vocational training of one year. Uh, I love and, that. And That's this wonderful. was uh, into, you know, sewing. So they can be able to run a skill and be able to support their babies and, and also yes. take care of themselves. So when That's we did this, one year they graduated and through my contacts, I had a contact at UNICEF in the country. And this lady was very gracious. She donated to us 30 sewing machines. And then we distributed to this, uh, you know, graduating class of the Sata girls. So they started, you know, their own businesses. They started sewing fabrics and they would sell them. And I, I want you to understand that uh, uh, fabrics, sewing fabrics, uh, it's, a, it's a big business back there. You, you can sew my shirt, then I'll, I'll pay you and then, you, you know, you get money. So these girls started, their lives really started changing. They started, you know, they were able to feed their babies. They were able to, you know put food on their table and that really got me thinking we should do something bigger than this and my, my wife was like now what do we stop here i said no honey we need to start an, we need to start an organization and that's how cairo was born we registered wow. cairo as a local uh, foundation back in rwanda we funded it ourselves uh, my, i and my wife we learned a small business uh, of cleaning we clean people's houses we clean hospitals to really raise money to be able to support our family and the, the girls. 
So that's how we started. We support. We then we we enrolled 120 girls into the program. We uh, currently have 170 young women. 120 are about to graduate, and then we have a, a new intake that is coming in uh, in the months of uh, October. And, and you know, besides just coach, uh, you know, sending to vocational uh, training, we do much more than just sending them to vocational training. Because when, mm -hmm. when they come to us, they are broken, they feel shame, they are, you know, mm -hmm. the, the community has disowned them. So we, need, we, we do a lot of, uh, you know, counseling. We have a counselor who, who is volunteering with us. She does a lot of counseling. We have a pastor who does discipleship. You know, he kind of like disciples them so that they can grow their relationship with God and, and that really helps them to heal. And uh, we also uh, make sure that the graduates are not just left to go. What we do, we, we kind of like, you know, give them startups, like the, 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 the woman who gave us the sewing machine. We want to give them startups to be able to start their own business. We, the government in Rwanda is very cooperative. So they form small cooperatives to be able to, you know, support their, to come together, bring their resources together, and then, you know, start their own small businesses. That helps That's them to awesome. really rebuild themselves so fast and to really, uh, you know, transform themselves and their communities. So that's what that we're doing. Amazing. We have an alumni group that you've created. You don't, know, you don't have to, you know, just go after you graduate. No, we want you to keep in the alumni group so that we can, uh, you know, still support you, do the counseling, disciple you, and you are part of Cairo as long as you, you want to be. And some of your graduates come back and now help, right? Yes. Actually, what, right. we, what, what we are doing is that uh, we're looking forward to some of our graduates coming back to, to even become teachers, to come and teach other, yeah, you know, great. other young women who are coming in, into the program. So that's what we are doing. And uh, we have seen God do, you know, amazing work. That's incredible. Yeah. Now, Nicole, you were telling me that you did something like this uh, similar, right? I did. Yeah, it was very similar. Um, when I was getting my internship done for my master's degree in counseling, um, I worked at a school for um, pregnant teens, basically. And so it was so nice because it was teen girls that didn't have a huge um, support system at home. So they would actually live on campus. And I was their counselor um, and I, well, underneath other counselors while I was on my internship program. But um, they would give them a place to raise their babies. Mm -hmm and also get educated. Mm -hmm. So it was really amazing. And then they also help them with vocational skills, which is the huge part so that yeah. they can go off and, and honestly take care of themselves. And, yeah. I, and I really believe it takes a village to raise a child. Oh, yeah. And so if you don't have support from family members, like you guys are saying, mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. like your, your situation um, and schools to help young women, you know, build community and teach them skills to be able to be on their own. Yeah. Yeah. And, and have that help. Yeah. That's, it, it's amazing to me. You know, I, the more we do this show, the more stories we hear and the more things that I discover that I, never even crossed my mind. You know, you just don't, I, all, all we know is our own experiences, you know, and, and that's what's so wonderful about this. I didn't even know that about you until we started talking about this. I know when we started talking about it, I thought about it. I know personally, my personal experience as a single mom, you know, I need family around. Yeah. It's just, it's absolutely, like I said, you have to have people, supports, and like it takes a village. And then I thought about it and I was like, wow, I kind of did that in the past. And I just really think there needs to be more of that worldwide. Yeah, you absolutely. know, especially in the United States, like single moms are thrown out there to the wolves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And I yeah. think it's amazing, uh, you know, the fact that because I think if you don't know the story of Rwanda, there's movies that you can watch that are horrifying. Um, and how long ago was that, John? How long ago with uh, genocide? Yeah. The genocide uh, happened uh, 30 years ago. 30 years. Yeah, okay. but we still have, you know, the aftermath effect is still very much rampant. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. So it's incredible that you and, as you were saying, like there are other people your age, I guess, kids coming out of school that wanted to go back yes. and rebuild. I mean, that yeah. that's what's so beautiful. You know, out of every crisis, I remember I, right after 9-11, I went back to New York uh, where I grew up. 
And it was it was beautiful to see the amount of people that had come together of all races, all religions, all all everything, coming together and you know rebuilding the community and just the love that that exists. And I think that's you know such a testament to uh, Rwanda and having citizens such as yourself that you know are willing to do that, but then go the extra mile. I mean, it's. It's interesting that you would have such a heart for for the women because you're not a woman, yeah. Right? Like, I mean, like it makes sense that Nicole that like that that was something you got involved in. But so, what is it about? I guess you, you were saying it was your sister. Yeah. It, uh, uh, why I really yeah you 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 you're asking the right question. I'm not uh, a woman, but I chose to help women because it has to do with uh, my other si- my sisters that really. Uh, did not get the opportunity to go to school, and that kept really you know bothering me, and I felt that I could do something. Yes, I'm a man, but I can I can help young women, you know, to you know also have the same equal opportunity like us. Sure. Yeah, and that's what really you know drove me to really like you know supporting young women. Well, and to rebuild a community, yeah, to rebuild a community, you would need everybody to need participate. Everybody. Yes, you know, so definitely. why have half of the population not educated and mm-hmm. not be able to contribute mm-hmm, mm-hmm. because, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, you know, yeah. and I mean, as we know, uh, Nicole's a great example. There's nothing women can't do, mm-hmm. right? So, I mean, exactly. yeah, if, if you haven't, <laughs> if, if you're new to this show, Nicole is the brains of this operation. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh, <thank you. laughs> the brains and the beauty. Not really sure what my part is. I think I'm just the comic relief. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Joseph, yeah. you're funny. <laughs> um, so. There is an opportunity now for people to help, right? Yes. You're, you're, you've, you've done amazing things. You have 170 yes. girls in your school right now. That's mm-hmm. incredible. 120 that are graduating. Mm-hmm. Um, but you want to do more and you want yes. to grow this and make it we, bigger. We, we want to do more. When we went to, to the district to ask for us, you know, to be able to like, vet the girls that were, were, had more needs, we wanted 120 and 500 showed up. Oh my gosh! It took us three days to be able to, like, you know, vet who is who has greater need than the other. It took us three days. So we have that could have been an easy job. Yeah, we could have we have so many people that I need, and with um, you know, that's why I I came here to really like you know register the audition here as a 501c3 to be able to raise you know sponsors and money to be able to support as many as we can. What I love about this story and one of the main reasons that I brought it to Nicole I wanted to share is, you know, for our audience who are predominantly single parents, um, it's it's always great to hear other people's stories because one, it helps you know you're not alone. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you realize right. that maybe your story is not as bad as you thought it was in comparison to other people. There's always somebody that has it worse, right? Um, this is such a unique perspective that there are people out there that really are on their own. I mean, in Rwanda, at least uh, here, we have some government assistance, right? Um, and right. that's another thing that we'll get into in a different topic. But, yeah. uh, you know, there, I mean, what do they do without you? It's, yeah. you if you're a, a woman and your family's disown you and the government's kind of now, and, the, and your whole community mm-hmm. is basically looking down on you, what, what do you do with you and your child? <laughs> No, we have uh, we have so many people that are you know completely on their own, and uh, that's gonna be so scary for yeah, anybody, a, yeah. especially these these young girls, mm-hmm. young girls that have forgotten, completely forgotten. They they're back there in the villages and oh know, my gosh, their their futures uh, they're very hopeless. They don't know what to do. Yeah, I mean you are an angel in that in that community i wouldn't say that I'm an angel, but i'm just trying to do what i can yeah to be able to help well yeah. to them i'm sure you yeah. are okay. you know? definitely yeah. yeah absolutely we need we need more of you in the united states we yeah. need more of you everywhere yeah yeah for sure um mm-hmm. I, I, I was encouraged to hear from you nicole that there are actual uh organizations that are helping to um educate and and teach them skills and whatnot because i mean that's really important we got to get people off the welfare system you know absolutely because it just becomes a cycle that you get stuck in so that i think the vocational piece is so important Mm -hmm. um that yeah it's a very important part so that you can actually be self-sufficient and take care of your child yeah now if you are watching this and your heartstrings have been pulled which i imagine they 
would be. If they haven't been, then maybe you're one of those narcissists we talked about in a previous episode. <laughs> but my I'm heartstrings saying. certainly are pulled. And um, if you if you feel like, man, I wish there was something I could do, well, there is. Good news. All right. So, guys, uh, what is a way that people can get involved and support the Cairo Foundation? You can go on the website right now today, the one that we have. And that's Cairo.Foundation. You can see it right there. There okay. is no .com or no .org. So it's Cairo Foundation. You can see it right here. Uh, yeah, click on that. You can go there. And, and what do they do? And um, the, the, there's an address that you can mail uh, support to. Okay. And then we're... What, we're type all... of, what type of support? Obviously, money's good, but is there, is there, are there other things that you're looking oh, for? Oh, and it, yes. In addition to the financial support, we encourage people to come over on mission trips. Oh. And when they come over on mission trips, we take extra measures to take care of them when they come. We'll custom design a, an itinerary for them um, around their interests and whatever, so that what they can do is they can uh, combine um, their travel plans. In other words, they could take vacation time, and instead of just you know spending it on the beach somewhere, uh, we can take them on a beautiful tour of the country, which is some of the most beautiful place on earth. And you can, we can take wow. them around to those places, and you, we can show you the heritage of the company or the, of the country. Um, we can even take you to the genocide uh, museum, which can can share Oof, with you yeah. how appalling that really was. Because you can never get an appreciation for the value of the work that John is doing over there, and this you understand what he's lifting them out of. Oh yeah, and and well, uh, you got to know where you came from in order to know where you're going. Yeah. You know. Now I'm very uh, happy that when I go there next month. Um, I've arranged a trip out to the uh, mountains because the mountains in, in uh, Rwanda are the only place where the mountain gorillas still live. Oh, wow. And so there's some really unique opportunities in, in the land of Rwanda. And then we're always open. If you have anything in your heart or in your skill set that you want to share with the people over there, um, if you come over and you're a tradesman and, and you've got skills in building or, or construction of any kind we can find projects for you because we have a a large undertaking that that is needed in order to build our own facilities because right now john is operating by through borrowed facilities and and uh it's amazing he shuffles people around and he, and he rearranges things and he's he's very artful and taking the resources that are available within the country through through the government through his own personal contacts and making sure that these, these girls get all the support that they need. The genius of his program is that he, after all this, after he goes through all these steps and lifts them up from the bottom and takes them up through this complete process and, and leaves them with a livelihood, the genius is that now he forms this alumni group where they can come together, they can share their ideas, they can prop each other up, they can share stories, they can learn from one another. How did you handle this situation? Whatever it is. And they can engage in that fellowship with those other people who have been through the program for the rest of their lives if they so desire. Well, you're giving people purpose. And that's that means so much. You know, when, when someone doesn't feel like they're making a difference or they don't have anything to do with themselves, I mean, that can be debilitating mentally. You know, and I imagine that seeing women, uh, so women out there that are watching this, if you are interested in a trip to Africa, <laughs> um, I imagine seeing women that are successful, mm -hmm. you know, that have accomplished things would probably be really inspiring mm -hmm. to a community that is taught that women shouldn't be. Absolutely. Yeah. Now... One last thing I want to touch on, because this was a big concern that I had and I brought up at lunch, is if you're like me and you watch some of those movies and you're like, I'm not going to Rwanda, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, Rwanda is a completely different uh, place these days, right? Yes. You were telling me it's yes. actually incredibly safe and the integrity that everybody has. Mm -hmm. Tell them just briefly a little bit about yeah. that. Yeah, I know uh, people tend to look at Rwanda in the lenses of uh, the 1994 yeah. Rwanda has changed since then. It is really uh, trying to rebuild itself. It has positioned itself as the hub for the East African community. Uh, when I talk about East African community, those are about seven countries that have come together to, to form an economic bloc. And Rwanda is the headquarter of all those countries. Oh, wow. Yeah. It is very peaceful. We have so many Americans that have left here. They now live there. You will find an American in the evening walking their dogs along the roads. Yeah, it's more safer. They feel safer. Some of them that I've talked to, they say, I feel more safer than the U.S. 
Wow. You know, so it's very safe. Well, that's not a big yeah. stretch these days. Yeah, <laughs> it's very safe. Uh, if you are, you, you, if you're coming to Rwanda for the first time, you would just, uh, you know, pay for your visa upon entry. You know, no, no more, you know, filling of papers or, or what. Just at the, at, the, at, the, at the airport. You were saying that if you were to lose your wallet mm -hmm. with cash exactly. in it. Yes. If you would lose, we have had all these incident, incidents recorded. If you, you would lose your wallet with uh, your passport and your cash in it, the following day, police will call you. Oh, we got your wallet. Will you, will you, will you come and pick it? That's how it is. That's how Rwanda... And the cash is still in it. The cash is still in it. So you don't get that yeah, in you, the United States. You don't. You, you don't get that anywhere. <laughs> yeah, you don't get that. Well, we, have had, we, have had, we have had, you know, uh, police, you know, you know, call people, strangers who have lost their property, come and pick them. So you, you, you go get your property. Amazing. Yeah. That sounds that sounds so cool. I yeah. would love to go. I think that's amazing. If you are interested in going, Nicole, you want to do a podcast from Rwanda? <laughs> We'll see. <laughs> if you are interested in going and getting involved and, you know, or just taking a trip and, and seeing what it's all about, okay, I think they contact you through your website, cairo.foundation. Um, if you're interested in helping in any way, if you're interested in donating, I mean, you're looking at John and his wife that's doing, doing this all by yourselves pretty much right yeah. now. Yeah. So obviously they need help. That's why we wanted to have them on the show, wanted to share this, wanted to inspire people uh, and encourage you to, Make a difference, you know, outside of your community even. So go to Cairo.Foundation and check them out and follow your heart, I guess, is probably the best way. Also, to. Joseph, I have something to add. I mean, sometimes I know in particular with the, my my clients, people that are going through, it could be a single mom or a single dad. If you're going through a lot of heartache and your anxiety, helping others is a really great way to sort of get out of that absolutely yeah, yeah, to find a purpose sure. and and help others yeah well i mean that's how i got through that's, that's what my first book was about which right wow, i've got the new copy right here oh, <laughs> uh, totally. yeah um but yeah i started that karaoke show i rock iraq you know which kept me distracted and made a difference you know for people uh so yeah absolutely completely agree the best way to get through your own stuff is to help other people get through theirs so right. completely agree. Well, thank you guys for being on the show. Really appreciate you coming out. Love the story. Love the mission. Um, definitely, uh, I, I'm excited. I might be coming out to, to visit you guys. So that would be awesome. Um, and again, if you guys want to get involved, go to Cairo.Foundation. Check them out. Dan, John, thank you so much for being here. And uh, Nicole, enjoy wherever you are. Carmen thank San you, Diego. Yes. And thank you guys for that beautiful story. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And we'll see you next time on another episode of Single Mom, Single Dad.